Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Muhammad al Hamoud from Future Pathways team. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for registering with Future Pathways. Today's lecture's title is Neurology in KSA. It will be presented by Dr. Hamad. Please feel free to send your questions throughout the lecture on the Q&A box, and we'll ask them to the doctor during the Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Dr. Hamad, you can start your presentation if you'd like. السلام عليكم جميعا. يعطيكم الف عافيه، اول شيء اشكر فيوتشر باثويز على المشروع جدا جميل في هذه الفتره نستكمل ايجيكيتنج اور كوليجز ونستمر في العطاء في مبادرات الخير في الصحه. معكم محمد البيعي، ام اي ار 2 ان كينج فيصل سبيشالست هوسبيتال ان نيورولوجي ريزنسي بروجرام. I'll speak a bit about the different areas and the different aspects of neurology, but I also want to make sure you understand why neurology is important, what are the opportunities for neurology, and um, just how beautiful neurology can be. Bismillah uh, So a lot of people ask why, Hamid, did you choose to go to neurology? Uh, as a young kid, I saw that there's an opportunity to um, look and study people that are doing significant things in the world. Why are they mentioned in history? Why are they significant in their textbooks? And then I found this guy, Albert Einstein. And they studied his brain to find out why he was considered a smart person. And they found out that part of his brain was larger than the usual population. And this was, in a sense, their theory of why he was a genius compared to the normal population. They actually uh, still have it in labs and someone's tried to steal it. And uh, um, they're still trying to figure out uh, different aspects of the human mind. And this is what sparked a interest in neurology. Just how one aspect of the human body can grow and develop in, a, in ways different than the other organs. All organs grow in the same way and develop the same aspects as other, other population. But depending on how you live your life, the experiences you have, the things you see, the people you interact with, you start to develop a specific type of, type of brain that works for you and helps you become a significant person in the world. So that's where my love of neuroscience and neurology came to be. And then that grew in college of medicine and then in, in, in the internship, working with the patients and uh, finding pleasure in understanding this organ. So um, let's talk about some misconceptions. A lot of people say it takes 21 days to form a new habit. Well, that's not really how it happens. H habits are actually the brain's function to, uh, automate, uh, to, to make an automatic or um, uh, to make uh, this skill or this learned uh, habit form in an automatic way, thus using less energy by the brain and then focusing the brain energy into more important things. And that happens in multiple ways. Uh, it first looks at the frontal cortex with the striatum, substantia nigra, and dopamine receptors. You create this uh, feedback mechanism that works with the, the reward system to um, make the, per, the, the brain passively uh, continue to do a specific skill or habit. And then it changes uh, depending on how complex the habit is. It can be five days to 200 days. And then we have the other misconception that memory is stored as files in the brain and we just retrieve them. Well, it, that's not really how it works as well. The brain is, um, or memory in the brain is a lot of um, different neurons interacting with each other. Each memory or each neuron carries a fragment or an element of a specific memory. Once those in neurons interact together, they would develop a picture. And that picture is the memory that you would um, hold and remember. So why would you choose neurology? Neurology is a specific, is a significant um, science that works um, in everything we do in life. The brain allows us to love, the brain allows us to write poetry, to have artistic expression, to be kind, to advance science and change the world. And it's the most complex, yet the most beautiful organ. So I hear this a lot whenever I'm trying to speak to people about neurology and they would say, but I'm going with a speciality that does nothing to the patient. It is depressing. 
uh, it has poor prognosis. It has nothing to do uh, or it does nothing to the patient and the quality of life. Well, let me show you some advancements that happen, that's happening recently. So we have schizophrenia, which is considered to be a very difficult disease to understand and treat. Now we have real work happening with uh, understanding that factor C3 and C4 is creating more um, uh, knowledge into how we can create a management that targets this and make sure that we don't have um, uh, the development of psycho schizophrenia and also manage schizophrenia in the future. In the case of autism, we usually know that autism is diagnosed after three years of life where the social aspect starts to um, surface and you would understand that this patient has autism. However, now in the first days of the patient being born, we can do a specific um, investigation where we see the CSF or the amounts of vasopressin in the CSF to understand would this patient have social disruptions and would that causing a possible biomarker for autism. And all this happened in 2018. Also in 2017, Bill Gates, who is a pioneer and a philanthropist in a lot of health issues, uh, took the responsibility of understanding Alzheimer's and create research towards Alzheimer's, which means that um, many or um, funding is going towards neurology. And in 2019, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, richest person in the world, also decided to fund um, Alzheimer's diagnostics and also more money is being poured into neurology specific research. So to answer the question, what am I gonna do in neurology? I'm treating nothing, it's depressing. Well, in nowhere in medicine would do you, do you actually have a cure? You don't really have a cure for pneumonia. You're only treating the infection and then usually the patient will come back three, four times in, the, in his lifespan. You don't really treat heart failure. You try to manage it with medications. And if the medication, if you have non-compliance or you have another insult or infection, the patient would deteriorate with heart failure. If you have renal injury, the only way you can do it is with real transplant if it continues to deteriorate, especially that we have diabetes, which is a third of our population. Um, systemic corpus erythematosus or in your rheumatological disease, you're just controlling it um, with uh, immunomodulator uh, medications, cancer, that's if you either take it out or control it aggressively, and that deteriorates the quality of life and trauma. You fix the trauma, but the scar remains. Liver cirrhosis, uh, it's a, just a vicious cycle of the, of the liver going into deterioration after deterioration. But think about the lives you're changing in neurology. When a patient has a stroke, you have the ability to return the function that the patient lost. The patient suddenly has no ability to speak, no ability to understand, no ability to walk. And then with your management, with your prompt, aggressive, and smart management, you would have the ability, bring back all of these abilities. Migraine is a very disabling and debilitating disease that a lot of people live with, especially the female population. Imagine someone living with this severe condition, not able, being able to communicate, enjoy life, and actually do their work, not being able to be a productive person in life. Your management and your understanding of this specific headache would show you that you can change this person's life. Epilepsy is a very de disabling disease as well. If you have proper management, you would have the patient living a normal life without ever thinking about another attack. Autoimmune diseases, movement disorders, demyelinating diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, all of these are happening in the same natural history as all other diseases and all other specialities. But when it comes to neurology, it's very difficult and it needs a very detailed mind and critical thinking to actually understand where, what's happening, where is it happening, and how prompt and smart your management is. It's very personalized when it comes to demyelinating diseases. If you have multiple sclerosis, every patient has a different medication. If you have um, 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 uh, Alzheimer's, every patient in a different Alzheimer's stage would have a different management. When you're working with neurology, you're working with a person. You have a personalized approach in everything that you're working with. It's not just a one medicine fits all. It's an uncharted land with so much opportunity and potential. Let me explain this a little bit more. So neurology is sophisticated. It, it hasn't progressed in the last few years because it needed the technological advancement that we have today. And this is a, a breakthrough that happened actually this year. Uh, a patient was uh, able to start walking after having 
uh, paralysis of his lower limbs. And this happened between the neurologists and neuroscientists and engineers working together to create a wireless implant that creates coordinated um, um, elect uh, electric shocks that would help the patient uh, create movement in his lower legs by connecting the neurological system. In Cleveland Clinic, they usually have a, a yearly medical innov innovation su su summit. In 2019, two of the top 10 were um, related to neurology, advisor for pre-hospital pre stroke diagnosis and expanded window for acute stroke intervention. This was done, or this was uh, actually uh, uh, released one year back, and it's a new um, protein that looks at the neural networks. It's something that was never discovered before. It's something that we recently found and has a crucial role in the embryological development of neural networks. Looking at that protein makes us understand what implication it has for the misgrowth of the brain uh, leading to different diseases. And this is a link on up to date. I'll share it later. That shows a big, expansive, detailed look at what's happening in neurology in the last three years. And I'm saying last three to five years because in the last three, five years, we developed a lot of technological advancements, a lot of communication, connection, a lot of working with neurosciences, engineers, scientists. And that made us understand the brain further, made us create a further understanding of what we can do with the brain. And thus we would understand our diseases of epilepsy, of Alzheimer's, neurodegeneratives, movement disorders even better. Top 10 neuroscience breakthroughs, breakthroughs of 2019, that's also a link. And it showed another, um, actually that's very interesting. It's a new neurological or neurocell that was never described in the past. And this shows that the brain itself is a very uncharted land that we can still find more advancements, still figure out how it works and still find things that we never thought uh, was possible. This is a human connectome project, which is basically a computerized brain. It has the specific fibers or uh, neurons going through every aspect of the body, but in a computer style. And that makes us um, kind of make our own understanding of how the brain works by using the computer to uh, modulate how it, how it reacts to specific stimuli. So neurology is based on patterns and that makes it a, a, the perfect speciality to in, in incorporate artificial intelligence, big data, machine learning and wearables, when, which is the basis of everything that's happening in our future. Neurology is exciting. You have a chance to leave your mark. As I said, every, we have a new protein that we just uh, discovered one year back. We have a new neuro cell that we actually discovered this year. Uh, we have new genetics that we're understanding. We have new programs that we're working on to lead to advancements in neurology. We have the, the, the most, uh, most accelerated advancement in epilepsy and stroke in neurodegenerative diseases. Literally every aspect of neurology is working in an accelerated pace in the last three to five years, which means you as a neurologist in the near future can work on any specific aspect of neurology and leave your mark, inshallah. So neurology is for those who enjoy research, for the detail oriented, for the critical thinkers, for the empathic and people that love patient interaction, people that love working with technology and tools and uh, people that pay, uh, with patients and puts 10 times the effort in a case. And let me explain this a little bit. So you have a very big area of research where, where it comes to neurons. You have case reports that are different because of the, how the neurological disease that occur. You have the genetics that works with uh, different uh, growth of neurological diseases. You have new medications, clinical trials that are gonna happen very soon. Detailed oriented because an examination of neuro neurological examinations is not that simple. You need to look at the fine detail of your result. How does it look compared to the normal standard of the patient? Um, it has a scoring system that is very detailed. Um, one specific thing not coordinating with your examination means that there's something wrong and you need to revisit your examination. So you need to be very detailed in how you approach your patient. You need to have critical thinking, thinking because it's not one plus one. It's not just an infection, give this medication. It works with a lot of staging of where your disease progression is and how um, you wanna target this uh, disease to uh, create the management. Uh, you need to be empathic because you're working with people that have 
once they have a neurological disorder, they have a very strong impact on their life. Their quality of life deteriorates and uh, uh, deteriorates very quickly and very rapidly. So you need to have this connection. You need to have this emotional intelligence uh, with the people you're treating because you need to connect with them and give them the support and hope that, uh, that can pro- you can pr- provide them with your management plan. And hopefully they will return back to baseline with smart and prompt management. Uh, working with technology and tools as I specified in the past, we work with a lot of tools if you're gonna go into interventional radiology, if you're gonna go, uh, and usually just a neurological examination is based on a lot of tools. Uh, EEG is a very complex and sophisticated tool. EMG is also a sophisticated tool. And you need to put 10 times the effort in a case because again, if you do not approach the case in a very smart way, if you miss the details, if you don't have enough data, you can easily misdiagnose or you can not understand the extent of the disease that's happening. Right? We always say in medicine, if, you, if the disease is very clear, then you're too late. So always try to understand where you are with the patient, try to diagnose as soon as possible and try to be very detailed. The challenges that we have in neurology is that it's a rapidly expanding body of neuroscience and information. Year by year, are gonna have new things, new medications, new genes, new diseases. So we need to be very up to date. You need sound clinical judgment because um, your approach is gonna dictate how the patient is gonna improve or continue to deteriorate. You need to have communication skills, as I said, very and compassion, as I said, because you're gonna be interacting uh, with the patient and their families, and it's gonna need a very empathic approach. And you need to appreciate medical uh, appreciation, medical ethics, because you're receiving a patient as a, at a very low quality of life in a very deteriorated state. And you need to respect the patient and all your communication and your interaction. So that's a big part of why neurology is amazing and why it's exciting and why there's a huge potential of neurology in your future. Now for the residency, the general residency is um, basically just a, a default way of presenting neurology. It's to um, give you the practices and of the uh, rapidly understanding information and sound clinical knowledge and compassion in your patient uh, approach. It's a five-year residency program, and then you have a required internal medicine uh, first year as an R1, and then the four years are neurology uh, rotations. In your rotations, you're going to have usually inpatient service, consultation service, neurology clinics, and epilepsy monitoring unit, pediatric neurology, neurophysiology, neuroradiology, and then you would have, depending on your center, different approaches of um, neuropathology, neuroophthalmology, and such. So the breakdown of rotations is a five-year program. The first year is a full-on internal medicine opportunity, where you have a mix of internal medicine rotations that intersect with your neurology practice. Year two, you're having neurology, um, uh, the neurology rotation starts, and that's when you become a full-time neurologist. You mainly focus on building a strong neurological base in your rotations, and of course, having a para-neurology knowledge through your sub-neurology rotations, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that further. And it's a good way to focus on your exam, the part one exam. It's uh, a very good year, not too hectic, uh, and it's a teaching year, so you can easily build your, build, uh, build your base as well as start setting up for your part one. Um, in your third year, you're ma- mainly focusing on supplementing your neurological base. So you need to make sure in your, your R2 that you have a strong neurology base in all specialities so that you can build on it and uh, start understanding the details of each disease. And finally, on your fourth and fifth year, you mainly, mainly f- focus on effective leadership and seniority uh, because you're going to start leading your team, leading your, uh, your juniors and start to uh, communicate with the uh, consultants in a more uh, senior way. And that's where your plans are actually just a verbal understanding of everything you communicated in the last years. And you're gonna have the trust of the consultant, so they're not gonna go back and forth with you a lot. So you need to be ready. It's also a good year to start preparing for your fellowship. In the last year, they usually don't have an extensive uh, number of blocks, so you have enough time to get ready for any examination and fellowship opportunities. So for just a breakdown, even further, year one, you have internal medicine, which is two, two months of internal uh, intensive care unit, three months of medicine, uh, then infectious diseases, endocrine, emergency medicine, two months of cardio and rheumatology. So all of these intersect with neurology. So I, I see you, you're going to have a lot of patients who deteriorate and you need to understand how they deteriorate and how you can stop deterioration 
by managing what's happening. And also you have patients that present with a hemorrhagic stroke, for example, those needs ICU care. Patients that have a stroke and then they uh, uh, are given a, a TPA, they need ICU care. Patients with status epilepticus, they're gonna need care. And internal medicine is just to give you a strong base of the internal medicine. Once you have a patient on the floor and he's coming with a stroke, one common complication of stroke is pneumonia. So you need to know how to understand how pneumonia happens and how you can um, catch it and treat it without pa the patient deteriorating enough to see it. Um, in infectious diseases, you have a lot of CNS infections that happen, uh, meningitis being a common one, and you need to know how to approach it, how to investigate it, and how to uh, treat it. And the CNS infections is very important to catch it before it deteriorates. Again, when you see it, when it's clear, it's already too late. Uh, and you have the infection happening inside the brain. So deterioration in the brain is difficult to return. Endocrine, emergency medicine, cardio, usually you want to focus on the AFib and those kind of cardiological uh, complications that would increase the risk of neurological complications. Rheumatology is a very big and shared speciality for any rheumatological disease, such as SLE um, that affects the brain. You have um, uh, sarc neurosarcoidosis and such. And then you have a leave where you can finally relax from the internal medicine year. For year two, you have floor coverage, consultation services, and clinics. The floor coverage, you usually have patients on the floor uh, and you round on them, you see them with the uh, consultant and you follow the plans. Consultation services where you are uh, usually free until you get a call. It's not usually free because you get multiple calls in the day and you would go see the patient. Consultation service is a very beautiful rotation where you get to learn um, in a very accelerated way because you're gonna see different uh, uh, diseases, different patients, and you're gonna have the opportunity to see this patient and then study this patient before you create your, your plan and discuss it with the consultant. And you can see a stroke patient, and then one hour later, you're going to see a neuromuscular patient, and then one hour later, you're going to see an epilepsy patient, all in a span of one day. In the clinics, you have just a normal clinic. It's not as hectic as other uh, 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 services, but again, it's also not that easy. Again, you need to, look, you need to be a detailed-oriented patient and also an empathic, uh, detailed-oriented doctor and also an empathic doctor. So when a patient arrives in the clinic, you need to be able to communicate get as much information as you need and deliver the information uh, in an empathic way and also understand the many concerns of the patient that comes to the clinic. Uh, neurosurgery also is a rotation that you have for one month. You have to go see the neurological, uh, the surgical side of neurology, uh, radio and the tumors, of course, and how you treat internal, uh, uh, intracranial pressure and how, uh, what so is. Uh, you also have radiology where you're going to see the different mechanisms of uh, imaging the brain, and we have a lot. It's not just MRI, CT. It's the sub, uh, sub imaging of all of those imaging techniques. And each one is important to identify your, med uh, your specific neurological disease. Psychiatry is also an important uh, rotation that is mostly floors and consultation and uh, clinics. Many have, again, a leap to enjoy life. Once you go to your third year, you're going to have more extensive. Um, uh, neurological rotations such as EEG, EMG. You also have the pediatric neurology for two months. And then again, you have psychiatry and research. And when you go into your fourth and fifth year, that's where you expand and go out of the hospital. This is your opportunity to actually go to centers um, if you want to go internally or outside. That depends on how well you prepare. And it's where you try to supplement the information that the, your center lacks. Each center is very specialized and has almost everything. But some centers have specific things that other centers lack. And that's where you need to understand where your deficits are. So by fourth and fifth year, you know where you wanna go. If you're in King Faisal Specialist Hospital, you wanna go to this hospital, KFMC for this month and um, uh, had us for a, a National Guard for that month just to get whatever you can supplement and vice versa in other centers. And again, you have another radiology uh, rotation and research. So that's mainly the, uh, the, the five years of neurology that you have. When it comes to the overview of the program, um, this is your daily activities or the activities of the week. You have the morning report, which starts di uh, differently in different centers. 
In our center, we have one specific morning report in the, on Sunday where it has the full department and we focus on endorsing and it's a full teaching ses session as well with the incorporation of all consultants. And for the rest of the week, we usually have, it's usually residents led, um, uh, led by residents and you would have one or two consultants uh, in the uh, morning report supplementing with teaching. And then every, uh, every week we also have the Neurology Half Day, which is an academic teaching by consultants. We have consultants visiting from outside the hospital to give an extensive look at a different topic. And then the other aspect of Neurology Half Day teaching is uh, basically preparations for MCQ and physical exams. So you want to prepare for your examinations uh, with the Saudi Commission. And finally, we have Grand Rounds, which is um, a two-hour session where we bring a visitor, uh, a guest speaker from outside. He usually is a very specialized person. Uh, we in the hospital had, in the last few months before lockdown, we had uh, Dr. Sakati, which is uh, one of the pediatric neurologist who discovered or uh, detailed the, described the Woodhouse Sakati syndrome. Uh, a few years back, they invited the doctor who, uh, uh, described and actually was the first person to write and develop the understanding about neuro, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So we get that uh, and also other hospitals get that level of speakers. Uh, so we want to look at a topic and understand it extensively by a very, by a strong expert in that field. And then the second hour would be a case presentation where we have uh, usually residents, senior residents uh, with their consultants describe a very specific weird case that we found on the floor. Are usually very interesting because you don't usually see that much of patients. In King Faisal Hospital, you see uh, the weird neurological manifestations you don't see outside since they get referred here. And that's always a good teaching opportunity. So just really quick talking about uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Um, recently, a month back, it was regarded as the number one hospital in the Arab world. And that looks at the different research potential that it has, the quality of uh, the services that we provide and the uh, vast amount of specialities that we provide for the patients in different neurological manifestations in specific and other specialities as well. This is an overview of our program. Uh, again, morning report, uh, endorsements, neurology half day, MCQs, OSCE preparations, and the departments, which is the grand rounds. Uh, the workflow usually that we have, we have a daily routine of um, uh, morning uh, meetings in the, in the first two hours. So around seven to eight, uh, we would have morning meetings. Eight to nine, we would have a table round with the senior in the floor if we're doing floors. Uh, nine to 11 or nine to 12, we, we usually are looking at our patients, examining, uh, doing the orders. And then from 12 to one, we have a teaching. And then by one, two, three, we're usually having the senior rounds and also the consultant rounds, finalizing, discussing, and finally making sure that all the orders are done. By 4 to 5 p.m., you need to make sure that all orders are done. Uh, everything has been, um, uh, you advocated for your patients and everything that they need by communicating to the different services that you want to consult, by communicating with the nurses to make sure your concerns are uh, going to be monitored throughout the next 24 hours by endorsing a very well endorsement to the on-call team. Your work tasks are, um, again, just describing it. Uh, you need to fully examine the patient neurologically. Uh, you don't usually examine a full neurological exam day by day, just when you need to. So some population of the patients just need a full examination on day one and then a full examination on the discharge. And, the and in, be in between, you only have specific things you want to look at in the neurological exam. Others, you need to have a daily neurological exam. Some patients, you need a Q four hour neurological exam, such as patients with hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, the stability of the patients are usually very stable, uh, depending on where you are in your service. Uh, when it comes to uh, patients in the stroke unit, they need um, very careful monitoring when it comes to the floor. If you have neuromuscular disease, you need to make sure that you see them every four hours, five hours, just to make sure they're not having any deterioration in their respiratory system. Um, autoimmune uh, demyelinating diseases usually are stable on the floor since they're receiving treatment. Epilepsy patients, you need to monitor just uh, in case they ha start to have seizures to avoid the seizures. Usually have a strong, capable nursing team that supports this. The number of patients depends on how heavy the hospital is. In our hospital, we have between six, 
per resident, and it can go up to eight per resident. Depends on how heavy um, the elective admissions and the emergency admissions are happening. Uh, and in the coming months, I think once we open, we're gonna have a heavy load um, with everyone that needs to be admitted. Rounds are usually haphazard uh, and haphazard depending on uh, which doctor looks at which patient. Different centers, they have one, one consultant rounding on all the patients in our center. We have uh, each consultant has a specific number of patients on the floor. So you need to make sure when the round is gonna happen to be prepared before the consultants arrive. Sunday, I uh, just highlighted this because you need to always be prepared in Sunday, whatever um, uh, uh, speciality you choose, because as the first day of the week, you need to make sure you plan out the rest of the week on that day. Know all your patients, know all the managements, or study all the diseases that you're gonna approach and make sure that you have a good fund of information. If you need to stay in the hospital till 8 p.m. just to make sure you know your patients, you know your managements, you make sure you have a good plan for the next five days or just finish working at home, do that. Always make Sunday for your hospital work. And then the rest of the week will be very easy because you're just following the Sunday plan. Uh, when it comes to discharge summaries and medical reports, that's something a lot of people don't like to do. So we don't do a lot of that because the patients are uh, usually uh, coming with one or two complaints. So discharge summaries are very short in, co in comparison to internal medicine where you have five to six complaints. Uh, you have a short hospital stay, again, so the discharge summary hospital course is not that long. Uh, when it comes to clinics, they're very enjoyable. Uh, it's very uh, filled with knowledge because you see different patients and you get to understand uh, quick teaching from the consultant and from the patient themselves on uh, the different uh, neurological diseases you have. You always need to have an initiative for exposure uh, because once you're stuck in a rotation, you can't go outside of it. So if you're in your floor and you have five patients that are all demyelinating diseases, you're gonna have a month of not seeing any other diseases. So you need to branch out and go see um, uh, the stroke consult that happened, even if you're standing by just looking at how it's happening, how the patient looks. Uh, go with the team in the ER and look at the different um, emergency neurological diseases uh, conditions that are arriving in the hospital. Uh, go see the different units, go see the consultations. Uh, you're not supposed to, you're not responsible to do that, but it's because you only have five years or four years in specific. And that's not really not enough to actually see everything. So you need to have an initiative to expose yourself to the different diseases that we have. And on calls are very different um, depending on the centers, but generally in all centers, on calls are beginning to become more heavy as we are creating more uh, services to the patients in neurology and we're seeing more patients coming with neurological diseases. <clears throat> Environment, so, Make sure you have all of these uh, all of these environments in your center. Uh, you need to have a center that is innovative because in the next, as, as you can see the last three years and the next years to come, we have a lot of advancements in, in technology in our, um, uh, uh, and uh, everything that comes with the future technology advancement needs to be incorporated in your speciality of neurology. We need to have a department that is willing and it's a hospital that is willing to go to the next level. Uh, you need to have an acad academic, uh, strong academic uh, base in your center. You need to have uh, consultants that want to teach. You need to have seniors that want to teach as well. You need to have a center for excellence where it works on developing the right um, pathways and protocols to give the patient the best care. You need to have open and communicative uh, center where it's easy to communicate with the head of the department, with the consultant, and not just between your senior. Uh, research is a very important aspect. If you have a center that does not value research and you want to go into neurology, that's usually a, uh, you know, we can say a red flag because without research, you're not going to start to understand uh, your neurological diseases in, in detail. Uh, you need to have evidence-based approach. As I said, um, everything that's happening with neurology is accelerating very fast. Every few years, uh, every few months, you're having new managements. Um, and with that, you need to have an up-to-date evidence-based uh, understanding of what, what's happening. You need your consultants to be uh, in that spirit of evidence-based approach, an up-to-date approach. So you need to read and you need to have your environment that reads so you can always be up-to-date and give the best prompt quality of management to your patient. You need to have a, uh, an environment that is friendly and forms a family of residents and consultants because that's the people you're gonna live with for the next five years. You need to have a supportive um, environment because 
uh, residency is not easy as, at all. You have days where it's very difficult. Uh, it's a load of patience. Um, it's work that's not ending. It's just overwhelming when it comes to work. One day you have uh, an overwhelming need to study while balancing your work. Uh, you have days where you are having personal issues. So you need a lot of things where it comes to, um, uh, uh, well, you need to have a supportive environment so they can support you whenever such things happen. And of course, you need to have a center that has a lot of subspecialities. So whenever people think about fellowships, some subspeciality, they want to go outside. But in, in a sense, currently, especially in neurology or in the medicine field, we have people that already uh, went abroad and they came back and they have the knowledge and experience and the connections to give a strong base of knowledge in subspecialities. So you need to have a center here. If you're with the same center that you worked with. So just looking at quickly at the fellowship opportunities, I know a lot of people think that fellowship opportunities for neurology is just like three or five things, stroke, epilepsy, movement disorders, and that's it. But you actually have a lot of things. So you have interventional radiology, you have autonomic disorders, you have headache medicine, you have neurohospitalists, balance disorders, neuroimaging, behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry, movement disorders, neuroimmunology and specific multiple sclerosis, child neurology, <clears throat> you have neural repair and rehabilitation, you have neuromuscular medicine, you have clinical research, you have neuroinfectious disease, you have neuropharmacology, uh, uh, neuro you have cognitive disorders, you have neuro-oncology, you have neuroophthalmology, you have EEG and clinical neurophysiology, you have neuroautology, you have sleep medicine, you have vascular neurology and stroke specific, <clears throat> you have neurocritical care, you have EMG clinical neurophysiology, you have epilepsy, you have neuroendocrinology, neurogenetics and your added neurology. That's, that's a notion of fellowship opportunities. So here's the opportunities that I have for you. The number of neurologists in Saudi Arabia is very little compared uh, to, the, to the people affected by, sorry, by neurology, not depression. So if you look at the neurologist to the population ratio, I forgot the number exactly, but in Saudi, in Saudi we have a very low uh, amount of neurologists and we don't meet the ratio at, at all, which means that in the coming years, no matter how many people go into neurology, you're always going to have a spot. Some areas in, in Saudi don't, they lack neurologists actually. And they uh, work with neuro, uh, they work with medicine, control medicine uh, consultants that have exposures to neurology, or they work with telemedicine with neurologists in other aspects of Saudi. So we need a lot of neurologists in Saudi Arabia. But you need to also understand that you're not going to work in the Riyadh, Jeddah, Sergiya. You're going to work in all aspects of Saudi. Uh, <clears throat> and also the specialized neurologists are very small in amount compared to the fellowship opportunity. So I showed you like a very long extensive list of fellowships. And in fact, we don't have a lot of neurologists going to those specialty. We actually just recently had last year, the first Saudi headache specialist in all of the neurology, neurologist history in Saudi Arabia. So we have many untapped fellowships. I don't think we have neuroinfectious disease, uh, neuro, uh, specialists. Uh, we only have one neuroophthalmologist and I think we only have one neuro rehabilitation. Uh, so neuro oncology, I don't think we have any. Um, but the field is open for different things where you can be a pioneer in, and you can be the first Saudi in. And of course, you need to supplement your neurology knowledge and experience with always continuing your uh, improvement through American Academy of Neurology. They provide an extensive look of support for all neurology residents in the world. Um, conferences, uh, knowledge uh, platforms, uh, uh, online uh, social media for specific for neurologists and res residents, sharing cases, sharing knowledge, opportunities, all of that. Saudi Neurology Society is also a strong society in Saudi that provides a lot of knowledge for the young physicians and opportunities for the senior physicians. Saudi Stroke Society is providing multiple opportunities for uh, contributing to the general public health and decreasing the stroke burden in the world and in, in Saudi. And the Ministry of Health actually has a lot of programs geared toward um, uh, uh, advancing uh, a lot of neurological diseases. And uh, the neurological burden reflects on the budgeting of the, uh, the country such that they are providing neurological specific uh, programs that they need to develop on an administrative le level. So just 
uh, ending with a little bit of knowledge about what are they looking for in a residence. You have to be an active contributor to society. Uh, with that, you're a person that does a lot of community service and provides um, education, tutoring, uh, programs for uh, support for neurological diseases, pa patients living with those neurological diseases. Uh, you need to have a backbone of a neurologist. So you need to be known as a person who understands neurology and wants to go into neurology and discusses neurology. You need to be, uh, and with that, you need to be active in being present in conferences and workshops and being seen by the neurology uh, community. You need to be active in research that matters, which means um, if you do a research that is survey-based, that's not really going to be interesting. But if you do a research that is actually uh, looking at a very solid structure of a research, or at least you're willing to do that type of research, that's where your uh, people uh, would consider you because again, neurology has a big aspect of research and the seniors and the consultants are looking for people that know how to conduct research so, so they can support their research opportunities. You need to be competent, you need to have trust. So if I trust you, if I see you rotating as an, as an intern and I trust you, uh, I trust your work, I trust you in your communication. I don't mean you do the things right. I just may, I mean that you have an open communication and you speak uh, in, uh, with integrity uh, and you do what you need to do uh, at the right time, then I would consider you uh, strongly because again, you need to have prompt quality, um, <clears throat> detailed approach when it comes to your patients. So if, I, if you have those things as a young physician, then you would definitely be accepted in neurology. Of course, you need to have the attitude and character that the social presence of uh, your internship. Uh, you just need to click with the whole um, uh, people in, in, in your department. So if you have everything, but you're not really having a relationship between you and the other residents, no one would want to work with you, um, but that's gonna make it very hard to accept you the next year. <clears throat> and also make sure you have the golden months where it's the last year, the last months uh, of uh, November, October, December, January, where you go and do your rotations there prior to the matching. So you have, they have a good memory and it has, uh, it's, it's not a, a month that people are going out on leaves so they can see you. Always try to get recommendations because you never know which doctor is gonna write something very strong about you. Recommendations is about your skills and your knowledge and your character. It's not about your speciality. So take any recommendations you can get, even if it's from an outside speciality. Always be a competent knowledge, uh, always have competent knowledge and be a learner. So I would like to always work with someone that is interested to learn more and more. Uh, always be, uh, have good conferences and workshops in, as a background. And if you have a research, that would be amazing. So the cumulative score for neurology is usually around 80, 79, 80, 81, 82. And just to be safe, every year I tell people score an 80 and you'll be fine. Usually we accept about 50 people around Saudi. In my center, uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, we accept between five to seven, depending on the years. Last year we expect, accepted, this year we accepted seven, last year we accepted six. Um, where should I put my effort as an intern? It should be on your SMLE. It's 50% of your cumulative grade, if, and it needs like three years of studying. Do your studying, score high in your SMLE, and the rest of the year will be for you to go through your internship year and do whatever you need to do to be an excellent doctor for your future and for your patients. So just uh, tapping into a little bit of the structure of an interview, always make sure you have five things in the interview. Always make sure you know yourself. Why do you want neurology? Create a narrative, a story. Like I told you in the beginning, my story was with the brain of Albert Einstein and that's why it sparked now, uh, interest in neuroscience and neurology. Why do you want this center? Always know the center you're going to. Um, and uh, understand why you want it. So every center has something special. Say I want your center because your center provides this, this and that as opposed to the other centers. Whenever you're talking about your research, also always make sure that you know your title, your methodology and the numbers or statistics that you developed about your research and also understand why you did this research. A lot of people would talk about their research and they're not convinced with their research. Um, so make sure you understand why your research is significant in the field. Your abilities and uh, skills always show that you're competent, uh, that you're an initiative taker, your communication skills are strong and you're a learner. Uh, again, have a backbone about your speciality by doing research, you're doing your conferences, uh, society work and whatnot. And have a base of knowledge because once they start asking you questions, you're gonna be able to answer. Also has 
a bonus is always to ask back questions to the interviewer. Always people are scared to ask questions, but that's actually a negative. Try to ask questions. That shows that you're interested. It shows that you really want to be part of their department. A bad example of a CV real quick has had different fonts, different designs, bad organization, and more importantly, the description is bad. So if you talk, talk about a blood donation campaign, you would say I was part of a volunteering group that participated in the blood drive of the King Faisal Specialist Hospital blood campaign. I, as an interviewer, I don't understand the value that you're presenting from your campaign. But if you phrase it in this way, you said that you coordinated and communicated between the donor and the back. You organize the restoration of participants. You produce the media video of the campaign. I can see action points. I can see what you did. And from that, I can take the value and use it for when I have you in my team. Uh, finally, with some lessons for your future, your interview and your CV, no matter how hard you work on, has already been 80% decided by your previous months of internship. So your CV does not match the efforts you put in your month of, res of internship. If you do an amazing job, an amazing job in your internship, this is your CV. They saw you in all your colors and they know to choose you or not to choose you. Uh, all int uh, interns went through the same pathway as you went through. They all have full CVs with interesting research, community work, rotations, which means your CV is not to show what you did most, but it, it is to show how to, how to distinguish yourself from most between your peers. So make sure your CV is to distinguish, not to show. It's not the amount, it's quality. Don't write what you did, write the value you bring to the program because of your past experiences with the, and that explained with the blood donation campaign example. Be professional, most of who will review your CV have been trained outside and abroad. I would like for the same quality and standard of CVs abroad. And, and it's standard because they don't want content to stand out. They, don't, they want the content to be what they read. They don't want to see a specific design or pictures or whatever. They want just this content in specific. Uh, in an interview, you should flow, not step. You know, you know yourself better than anyone. So I don't like to give advice of people to memorize your interview and then go in and just say, hi, my name is Hamad. I like neurology. I want neurology. And because I did this, this, and that. You're doing step by step. It's very robotic. It's not very humanized. And um, that really it doesn't really look good in an interview. Just flow in your interview. Know the five things that I told you to memorize or to understand about yourself. And then just flow through it. Answer it as you would in a very normal discussion. An interview is selling yourself. So you need to show your assets. What are you gonna to bring to your institute that you want to be accepted in? And show them that this is the value that they need. In an interview, tell them what they want to hear because you have a very limited time. In an interview, always be prepared, know where you're going and who you're speaking with. So study and understand the consultant that's gonna prepare an interview. You understand what they like to hear, understand what they're gonna ask study the center and know and speak about the center because they want people that re, uh, have the same vision and mission uh, their center has and most importantly be yourself and be honest because that's how you get anything in life and finally the brain is wider than the sky uh, thank you so much for this opportunity good luck always work hard and i'm always ready to support anyone who's interested in anything in related to healthcare and in specific neurology Inshallah, I'll see you with my colleagues. I'll see you with my colleagues. And I'll see you with your colleagues. I'll see you with your colleagues. And I'll see you with your colleagues. I'll see you with your colleagues. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamad, for your great presentation. I've had a lot of questions. There are some questions now. Do you want to read them or read them? Maybe I'll read them in a short way. So, let me know. Let me know. Uh, first question is how about patient satisfaction? You actually have a strong patient satisfaction. Again, it depends on you as a neurologist. If you have prompt um, management, aggressive management, and proper detailed diagnosis, critical thinking, you're going to have a good satisfied patient. If you're, uh, if you're a neurologist that doesn't put effort in studying and understanding neurological diseases, you're not going to be able to catch something until it's too late. And when it's too late, it's causing a lot of um, issues to the person, and that's difficult to reverse. Uh, but I saw patients that had status epilepticus, then they were near coma, and then we revived them back to people that started living and walking around, and we see them year by year in the clinic. I saw patients that had a stroke, full left-sided stroke. They can't move their left side completely. And actually, last month, I saw them walking around in the hospital getting a refill on their medication completely without any issues. 
Um, so it depends on you as a, as, a, as a doctor. Do you want your patient that comes to you to have a better outcome or a negative outcome? And that's all the efforts you put in studying and understanding the diseases you're gonna deal with. Uh, as a student who is interested in neurology, how can I do research in that field? So I always tell people three things. If you wanna do research, uh, research everything that is about neurology and find something that is interested to you and something is at your level that you can do. Get package it up in a proposal and, and, uh, and as an idea and approach senior residents or consultants and someone will find your idea interesting and would support it. If you can't do that, then go approach uh, senior residents and consultants and ask them, I'm ready to work. I have previous experience in work and I would like to contribute to any research that you have. It's either you contribute to the research, which is very difficult because honestly, as a student, you don't have much, uh, uh, they would not see you as a competent person unless you prove it with your previous work. So they're not gonna give you the work unless you show them or you come with an idea and they were not, they're not gonna lose anything working with you or supporting you. So make sure that you always have an idea by standby. Uh, doctor, I heard that neurology has a high percentage of burnout among neurologists, is that true? So it depends on the center. Um, and again, I wouldn't say it's one of the highest, but it is very high to burnout when it comes to neurology, uh, because again, it depends on the load of the patients you have and the amount of effort you put in the patient. Um, the consultants once told me, all services, all speciality, even surgical specialities. If you want to put in the effort and work throughout the years to grow yourself, then you're gonna be very tired at the end of residency. If you just want to do the baseline and just go through residency with the baseline of everything, then you're gonna have an amazing life. So burnout actually depends um, on how much effort you put and the effort you need to put in neurology as opposed to other uh, uh, specialities is very high and you're gonna enter, uh, see a lot of burnout. Uh, you need to learn how to approach burnout. It's very important in your future. What is this difference between adult neurology, pediatric neurology? So the difference is basically the diseases and the approaches. Uh, our cutoff is 14 years. Once you have 14 years, the patient will usually be uh, transferred to our care and we continue the management on their diseases. Uh, we usually share some diseases, but there is a clear cut between pediatric diseases and neurology disease. I hope I answered your question. If you have another answer, you can, uh, if I didn't answer it, you can ask further questions. Since neurology has been and is a fertile field of research and participating, re participating in research has a great impact on being accepted, what's your advice for interns who just decided to apply for neurology and want to participate in projects? Taking the consideration of the current circumstances of the pandemic. So just to make it clear, you don't really need to have research. You just need to show interest in research and understanding in the research methodology. If you don't have research, and you don't have time to make research, just, again, show that you have the skills and the understanding of the different aspects of, the, of the, the research methodology, and you have a good understanding. And of course, the competency to carry on a research project. That's it, that is enough. Uh, but always try, even during a pandemic, you're gonna have uh, opportunities. Uh, if you keep knocking doors, uh, surely one will open. How will the salary be compared to other specialities? So compared to other specialities, for, Saudi Commission, all residents and all specialities have the same level of um, uh, salary. When you go into uh, consultancy, that also has the same ladder for different specialities, but it changes depending on uh, the hospital. Even in residency, each hospital gives you al uh, uh, more than other hospitals. So you would find a small difference that is very, uh, it's now re re very significant between the centers. Does neurology affect daily life? I'm not sure what you mean exactly by does it affect daily life, but yeah, you need to be you need to incorporate it in your life because that's who you are for the next years of your life as an occupation. But you need to have a clear cut between your life, living your life, enjoying your life, and also making sure that taking neurology with you in your thought process, in your studying, in your reading, in your enjoyment of um, things. So I like to take neurology and I like to read about neuroscience. It really doesn't have implications in um, my field as a, clini a clinical clinician, but it does have a further understanding about how I can approach neurology in the future. Uh, where do you recommend interns to take their elective neurology rotation? I would recommend you to ask to talk, talk to seniors in each hospital and see what each center provides. And depending on what you like about the center, take your elective there. Uh, don't just take uh, an elective haphazardly because um, each center is different uh, with some specific things. 
but you need to always make uh, sure that if you're going to do more than one month, try to do one in the specialist hospital, try to do one in National Guard, and try to do one in King KFMC, King, uh, King uh, Fahad Medical City. These are the pr prominent neuro neurology centers in Saudi. What are some good neurology journals? Um, uh, JAMA Neurology, Elastic Neurology, and also uh, neurology.com as a, a journal as well. You have Continuum, which is basically uh, what we all as neurologists are reading. Continuum is what you need to be introduced to and start reading and understanding. It gives you a good understanding about different uh, uh, lessons uh, or different uh, updates about neurology. It's written by consultants and specialists in the field. And it's usually every few months you have a specific journal printed with all the advancements and updates in a specific field. What about the need of neurology in the private sector? It is also very important. A lot of private sectors don't have neurology. So if you don't have neurologists in Saudi, except for a small number, then the public and private sector are not having enough neurologists. So you have an opportunity to actually work both in public and private. Um, what neurology books do you recommend for a fifth year medical student? Um, I would recommend first aid neurology uh, board book. It's a good book to give you a strong base and it's not much uh, of reading. Once you have that, there's a different book you read for residency. Uh, there's also uh, a book for neuroanatomy. Whatever book works with you, you can use it. Uh, I like uh, a book called Draw It to Know It. It's a neuroanatomy book that gives you step-by-step -step how to draw the anatomy and connect it step-by-step uh, -step to see how the neurological system at the end connects to each other. How can I tell if I want to specialize in neurology or neurosurgery? And is it possible to switch from neurology to neurosurgery? So it's always easy to switch between different, uh, not easy, but there's a possibility to switch between any services or uh, specialities once you go into it and if you don't enjoy it. Please, if you don't think the speciality, speciality is for you, switch. You have the autonomy to go through anything you want in life because that's where you're gonna focus you the rest of your life in. Um, it's very different. Neurosurgery is surgery, neurology is neurology. You treat with medicine, you have a lot of thinking. Neurosurgical, you have a lot of working with your hands and you go in uh, more invasive uh, uh, type of work. Is the patient outcome generally bad as some residents from other specialties make it out to be? If so, how can we cope with it? Thank you. No, it's not bad at all. It's, it's actually, again, depending on how you try to do your management. If you're a person that is passionate and studies and grows their skills and diagnostic and man management, you're gonna have beautiful outcome for your patient, no matter how horrible the neurological disease is. If you are not that competent, you're gonna miss a diagnosis, you're gonna take longer than needed to manage your patient, then the deterioration will continue to happen. That's when it becomes a difficult outcome. But at the same time, you need to also understand that there are very bad outcomes when it comes to some diseases, uh, something that you can't control. And once that happens, you need to also know how to approach your patient, be very empathic, and also try to be supportive to your patient and for yourself as well. Sometimes it's just very difficult. Um, in this crisis, we've been uh, in this crisis, we've been rejected from centers at entrance, and we lose the opportunity to prove ourselves in Golden Month. Your advice. Uh, so it's very difficult. Even if you go to the center itself, uh, it's, you're not going to have any opportunity to do a lot of neurology or any other specific speciality because of the, the, the lockdown. But in the next month, most likely, all the centers were going to reopen and you're gonna have the opportunity to do in the golden months, October, November, December, inshallah. I think these are all of the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamad. We really appreciate your time and effort here today. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, inshallah, Dr. Shada will give us uh, neurology in Canada in a few minutes. So uh, mm -hmm. stay tuned. يعطيكم العافية جميعا هذا رقمي النقاط التواصلي في الإيميل والسوشيال ميديا إذا عندكم أي أسئلة ثانية وحابين تشتغلون في شيء فأنا موجود دائما وأدعمكم فيها يعطيكم العافية